morning. Uh, actually, I think we'll start in Luke chapter number three. And uh, continuing in our series, The Jesus I Never Knew. Amen. The Jesus I Never Knew. The Jesus I Never Knew. Uh, we're going to be uh, spending a little bit of time uh, going through these uh, continued series as we walk and explore who Jesus is and why it is relevant for our lives. Luke chapter number 3 is where we'll start, then we'll jump over to Luke chapter number 12. Uh, I am uh, one who uh, finds these passages in Scripture to be particularly uh, uh, challenging, if you will, and, and uh, prayerfully uh, uh, life-giving to us in the name of of the Lord. So Luke chapter number three, uh, let's start here in verse number 16. Actually, verse number 15. Why don't we start there? Verse number 15. Uh, the word of God, Luke chapter number three, uh, verse number 15 reads, and the interest of the people by now was building. So John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness, uh, preparing the way of the Lord, and, and we see uh, him uh, kind of speaking and talking in a very powerful and fiery way, and the Word of God says that uh, the interest of the people was building, and they were all beginning to wonder, could this John the Baptist be the Messiah? But John intervened, saying, I'm baptizing you here in the river. But the main character in this drama, the one who is to follow me, to whom I hear a stagehand, will ignite the kingdom life, a fire, the Holy Spirit within you, Changing you from the inside out. He's going to clean the house and make a clean sweep of your lives. He'll place everything true in its proper place before God. Everything that is false, he'll put out with the trash to be burned. Mm. I don't know if y'all ready for Jesus to take out the trash in your life for God. <laughs> That's, 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 that's quite some uh, statement here. Then, Luke chapter number 12, uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to read all the way down uh, to the, the major part of our text. But I encourage you to read the whole chapter. It is a very profound, fiery uh, kind of exchange of Jesus. Uh, but if we go down to verse number 49, Luke chapter number 12, verse 49, the word says, Jesus speaking, I've come to start a fire on the earth. How I wish it were already blazing. I've come to change everything. Turn everything right side up. How I long for it to be finished. Do you think I came to smooth things over and make everything nice? Not so. I've come to disrupt and confront. From now on, when you find five in a house, it will be three against two and two against three. Father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against bride, and bride against mother-in-law. Then he turned to the crowd. When you see clouds coming in from the west, you say, the storm is coming, and you're right. And when the wind comes out of the south, you'll say, this will be a hot one, and you're right. Frogs. You know how to tell a change in the weather, so don't tell me you can't tell a change in the season. A God season we're in right now. I can just sit down and just call the altar call right now. You don't have to be a genius to understand these things. Just use your common sense. The kind you use if, while being taken to court, you decided to settle up with your accuser on the way. Knowing that if the case went to the judge, you'd probably go to jail. Lord, that person. And pay every last penny of the fine. Listen, that's the kind of decision I'm asking you to make. The word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. All right, we're going to speak and preach on the topic today. Jesus got that fire. Jesus got that fire. Father, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and you, the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let the people of God say amen. 
Can I say it like they say in the Ferguson? Tell you that you just got that fire, man. Come on, tell me. Just got that fire, man. <laughs> Anybody ever ask you, why do you do what you do? How you do? How can you love these folk who are so unloved? How can you make such unreasonable, seemingly uh, beyond one's kind of imagination levels of sacrifice? How can you forgive those folk who keep doing you wrong? How is it that you can get along with folk who are obviously obnoxious? I tell folk all the time, it's that fire, homie. It's that fire. There is a fire that God has placed inside each and every one of us that should force us Fuel us, push us to do that which others would regard impossible. A fire. A fire that does not come from human origin. A fire that can do a whole lot of different things all at the same time. Talking about a fire that arguably, if you and I don't have, we will be consumed by a different fire. Make no mistake about it, brothers and sisters, there is always fire burning in, around, in our proximity. And the question is which fire is burning within? And dare I say, around you. What fire can I rely on to help you and me and us and we accomplish a calling that, again, is not of human origin? Because a lot of us get it twisted and we think that you do what you do because this is just your talent. This is your skill and your gift. And the minute that you do have that, but how many of you are aware that there's something that God would have for you to do yeah. that transcends what you do solely on Monday morning when you go punch the clock? Yeah. And there's a certain kind of gifting and a certain kind of calling. And I want to submit to you that it is a fire that comes from God. When we read the Gospels, we see the Gospels giving you and I an introduction to Jesus. A Jesus who is unfamiliar to the listeners. A Jesus that requires a whole lot of uh, repeat performances. Jesus' life, dare I say, was the encore that never ended. Jesus just kept proving himself over and over again. And what's so fascinating about it is we find four recorded gospels that continue to tell but they all have a particularly different angle because I believe many of us need to see Jesus in more ways than one. Matthew's audience was Jewish. And Matthew was intending to show that Jesus was the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy and, and messianic expectations. So Matthew consistently through his gospel talked frequently about how Jesus was fulfilled and Jeremiah, and all of the expectations of the Jewish people. Mark's gospel was, was the first gospel that was written, and many think it was written with a Roman audience in mind. And its intention was to just give a quick factual account that Jesus lived, Jesus did some things, Jesus died, so the Romans and all those who read would not be uh, 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 kind of confused about what actually happened, but they would know that Jesus had an immediacy about his mission, of urgency, of focus, that Jesus really was here. John had this focus in his gospel around answering this question, is Jesus truly God? Is he divine? Is he someone that is worthy of spending and, 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 and building my whole life on? Is Jesus someone that is radically different than even the wind and the, 
the, the, the, the, the waves obey him. And he's able to heal and, and do all these different kinds of things, showing his supremacy over nature and over the created order. And then you come to Luke, which I find to be one of the most revolutionary books in the Bible because you find Luke writing in two different kind of, of, of accounts. The first account is the account of Jesus in the book of Luke. And then you have the second account, which is the account And some of it is a revolutionary thing today. Because so how many of you know that in that culture where it is a pre-Jesus culture, it is almost very similar to our culture today, where we are now living in a post-Jesus culture. The idea that people have heard about Jesus and spent time with Jesus, how many of you know does not change the fact that all of us need to be able to answer the question, Or what we believe about Jesus matters. You can't just come to church and sing these songs and hear these sermons and then just go back out and not be changed. What you think about Jesus matters. Because it will impact the way in which you engage the world. I'm convinced that bad theology, bad beliefs produce unfaithful Christians who engage in faithless acts. Your bad beliefs, my bad who engage in faithless acts. You can't say you believe Jesus came to set the captive free and then be okay sitting on the sidelines while the structures hold people in captivity. You can't say Jesus came to forgive us of all of our sins and you refuse to forgive yourself or those around you for the things that they or you have done. It touches. 
just tell your neighbor, that fire will change you. That fire will change you. Jesus got that fire. Now, when you take a look at the biblical text, fire has been used in all kinds of ways as a direct association with God. When Jesus is leading the children of Israel through the desert, the scripture says, he used a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Leading me to believe that fire can serve as a source of direction in your darkest moments. That's right. In the book of Leviticus, the priests were told to light a fire on the altar of the tabernacle as a sign of God's eternal presence, and the fire was to never go out. Yes. Leading me to believe that the fire can serve as an ever-present source of God's presence in our lives, reminding us that with this source, we'll never run out or be left alone. In the book of Kings, Elijah had his confrontation with the false
And Jesus is not just interested on changing the outside and leaving your inside the way that it is. But when Jesus comes to bring that fire, how many of you know you can't help but have everything changed? And it is this fire that Jesus comes to bring that will not let any of us off the hook. My brothers and my sisters, you must appreciate that there is an internal change and transformation that must take place when the fire begins to burn. And what I appreciate about the fire of Jesus is that the fire will not burn that which does not need to be burned. And that's why you better get the fire of Jesus and not the fire of the crowd. So oh, help me in here today. Because see, cause see I, I'm not that discriminatory with my fire, praise God. Amen. You get me breathing, amen, some fire, amen. I don't know where it's going to go. But how many of you ever had an experience with Jesus where everything that needed to be removed, he took it out? And everything Even with 
the sacramental nature of baptism, the sacred and the secular, the 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 the, the, the divinity and the humanity, the 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 collision of God with us here in our own time is is the sacramental nature of baptism. That water left alone will only clean you up, but when the Holy Spirit starts to trouble the water. Church is going to be here always too. 